form. In fact, we have a, a full house. Um, so you're all very welcome. Um, and obviously, I advise you all to maintain social distancing um, during the meeting. Um, today's meeting, we will consider a, a briefing from TransLink on the COVID-19 response and recovery. And Hansard will cover that session. Um, and then we have some subordinate legislation. We have no apologies. We have no chairperson's business and we move then to item three which is the draft minutes um, of the meeting of the 27th of may 2020 and that's at page six can i our members content right thank you and moving then to matters arising at page 14 um, again from last week's meeting do members have any issues in relation to to that Content or yep. okay, thank you. Move then to our briefing from from TransLink, and that's at page thirty of your of your pack. As I said, um, Hans Sard will be um, recording. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. You're very welcome to, to committee. Um, if you'd like to make a few open remarks and then members will follow up with some questions. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members, for uh, inviting me here today. I have uh, sent through a, a brief, so you, you have that. I, I won't go through every line on the brief, but I thought it might be worth just covering some of the, uh, some of the highlights. <clears throat> In terms of uh, the COVID-19, <clears throat> Um, we have introduced a wide range of measures in stations and onboard services to help mitigate against COVID-19 and, and keep public transport safe. Um, there is a list there in the brief that I, that I gave you, but just to highlight a couple of those, um, obviously we've made uh, a number of service reductions uh, as we were entering uh, the lockdown phase, um, and reducing um, to a, a Sunday service on most services. Um, uh, but that enabled essential workers to travel safely during the crisis, and we did engage with a lot of essential workers, both in, uh, um, um, in, in in all areas, really, to look at where we could best suit their needs, and we did make adjustments to timetables to suit the needs. Um, however, passenger numbers are now increasing, and we have increased our services um, to what I would call a Saturday service, or close to a Saturday service, uh, in urban areas and on the rail network, uh, and that's enabled us to um, maintain social distancing um, throughout the service. And so, just to put that into perspective. Um, we are currently seeing about 10% of our normal uh, passenger demand at the minute, um, and we have about 80% of our normal uh, capacity on our rail network and on our metro network, and about 60% on our Ulster bus network. So we have significant capacity in place to, to manage uh, social distancing. We've also got extensive PPE has been supplied to staff, um, and, and a number of uh, additional PPE initiatives, such as Perspex screens in, in buses to protect uh, um, passengers and staff. Um, we've got hand sanitizers in place in all our stations. We've rigorous hygiene cleaning now in place for buses and trains, um, both uh, um, at the evening, also deep cleans on a regular basis, and also then during the day as well, um, uh, continuous cleaning of, of touch points. Um, we've also implemented quite a few uh, changes to our stations, and we'll be asking staff will, or passengers will see that as they return. Uh, they need to be prepared to queue for different entrances and exits, uh, and also just to, uh, and we're encouraging passengers really to think about their travel and think about the services that they want to use, uh, and perhaps to uh, and not go at rush hour and look at different times and be more flexible about how they use public transport. Um, and we've also implemented uh, our contactless and prepaid tickets and increased the number of tickets that can be purchased that way, and encouraging more people to use. Uh, this method, and if they have to use cash, to use the exact fare uh, only. And we also have extensive signage and station and communications are in place to reinforce the public health uh, uh, messages and also uh, um, uh, a lot of messages around hygiene and social distancing. Um, as a result of the extensive work that, that we've done uh, during this period, um, uh, we have about 4,000 staff in TransLink, uh, and we've had a very low incidence of positive COVID-19 cases, and I think that's evidence of the, the strong work that's been put in place to, to manage safety of our staff and, and our passengers. Uh, and we, through this whole process, we've had really good engagement with, um, our, with our employees, with safety reps, and with our unions. 
Um, we have a strong record on safety generally. We manage a high hazard environment with multiple risks on, on road and rail every day, and, and COVID-19 is one more risk for us to manage. Um, and as we come out of lockdown and we look at how the executive um, phases the, that recovery, uh, we'll continue to manage this. We'll continue to take public health guidance. Department for Transport has a, a guidance on safe travel and, and the Department for Infrastructure as well. We work very closely with and constantly review the measures that we take um, to make sure we maintain uh, all of the safe travel that we currently have in place uh, and the social distancing aspects of that. Um, and I suppose our key message to passengers really is to you know, help us to help you. Um, we will put all these measures in place and guidance in place, but um, passengers do need to adhere to that. Uh, and they also do need to you know, have respect for other people using public transport as well. Uh, and so we, we're very clear messages, help us to help you. Uh, I did want to touch on a few other things that Translink has been doing during COVID-19. Um, you know, obviously, the Minister announced uh, free essential travel for NHS and social care staff, and Translink were very pleased to offer that facility um, to staff um, and essential travel during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we have also continued to participate with civil contingency emergency planning measures uh, in line with the PSNI. Uh, we have launched the, the Chase the Rainbows campaign, which is a very positive campaign for both our staff and for, for our customers, uh, and you know, trying to send out a message of hope that we, we will see the end of this uh, at some point. Um, and we have also been working closely with uh, charities such as the NHS Charity Together and Cancer Focus NI Charities. Uh, and we've indicated that some of the surplus funds we get from our no change policy would go to those charities as well. Um, we've also provided additional shuttle bus capacity to help frontline NHS staff access local hospitals, and we've also provided uh, a service for the Northern Ireland blood transfusion uh, staff in the same way. And many of our staff, very pleased to say, many of our staff across Northern Ireland have helped to raise funds and organise food parcels and supplies for hospitals and care facilities, and we've used our services to deliver these to these facilities as well. In terms of funding, um, uh, we very much, I mean, uh, we, we've covered this extensively uh, every time we meet, but obviously it's a very different situation now uh, post COVID 19. Um, we are very uh, acknowledge the, the support that we've received from the executive and from the Department of Infrastructure recently in both the 2021 budget and the, the new COVID 19 funding that has been recently received, and this is very welcome. Um, However, additional support will be required to ensure that Northern Ireland retains a, a viable public transport network going forward, uh, and this will be essential to support sustainable transport and a green economic recovery as we emerge from this crisis. Um, I certainly do take comfort from the fact that uh, uh, the executive have made a commitment uh, to continue to support public transport and continue to support TransLink, uh, and I suppose that gives us some comfort that these issues will get resolved uh, as we move through the year. Um, and certainly, we are fully committed to working with the executive and with the Department of Infrastructure to deliver the, the strategic outcomes in the draft programme for government to connect people and opportunities through infrastructure. And I think, as we have seen in recent days and weeks, you know, the importance of having an efficient and effective public transport network uh, in, in Northern Ireland. In terms of capital funding, um, uh, you know, notwithstanding the sort of recent pressures uh, as a result of COVID-19, we have continued to maintain good progress on our key capital projects um, and continuing to, to work to finalise the capital budget with the Department for Infrastructure. Um, these projects are very important projects to revitalise the local economy, uh, to boost local manufacturing and construction industry, and, and will certainly help Northern Ireland um, um, at the forefront of sustainable transport initiatives. Um, key projects I have mentioned there, but I'm pleased to say at the Belfast Transport Hub, uh, work has started on site. Uh, and this has the potential to create over 400 jobs uh, in the years to come uh, and, a, and a big boost to the construction sector. Um, we also have uh, our, the 21 new train carriages on order, and manufacturing has started again with our uh, manufacture of those train carriages, uh, and we are still hoping for delivery in 2021-2022. Our hydrogen bus pilot project remains on target for later this year. We, we hope that the manufacture will start again very shortly. Uh, and we have further zero emission both hydrogen and electric bus orders, uh, which we'd like to place uh, uh, for delivery in 2021-2022. And again, a big, we see a big opportunity now to, to move forward uh, uh, with our sustainable transport initiatives, particularly on low and zero emission vehicles. So, suppose in conclusion, um, you know, we're continuing to provide an essential service during the crisis, uh, and I, I do wish to sort of place on record my thanks to all of the Translink staff who have worked so hard 
uh, and in many cases taken personal risk in these challenging weeks to, to keep Northern Ireland moving. Um, public transport will have a key role as Northern Ireland emerges from the present crisis, uh, and bus and rail services are already helping to reconnect communities as people begin to return to work and economic activity. Uh, we remain committed to, to being at the forefront of efforts to combat climate change and air pollution. Uh, these uh, issues have not gone away, uh, and uh, they will need to get continued focus on uh, as we emerge from COVID-19 crisis. Um, and of course, we'll continue to work with the Department of Infrastructure, with the Executive, and with the Committee uh, to ensure an efficient, sustainable public transport service delivered in Northern Ireland. <coughs> That's, that's all I wanted to say. We okay. coverage some of what I said in my brief, but uh, I thought it was worth uh, just repeating some of those messages. Thank you very much, and Chris. And I suppose really it goes without saying that we really need to acknowledge the, the work um, and the continued work of um, staff within TransLink um, who have continued throughout this very difficult time um, and have um, certainly offered a service particularly to um, NHS workers at a, very, at a time which was of great uncertainty. Um, right across across Northern Ireland, um, the committee has um, continued, and I suppose will continue to offer support with regards to um, TransLink's budget. Um, the estimate shortfall that we have at the present time could be up to 114 million pounds, which I suppose is really um, beyond where we were a number of months yeah. ago. And certainly, COVID has has added to that pressure, particularly around your your passenger num passenger numbers. Um, what is the current estimate in relation to that likely shortfall? Well, it, the, the estimate you quote is correct. Um, you know, it is uh, based on an assumption. So we've got a set of assumptions over the next 12 months of how passengers will return to public transport. So we do anticipate some fare box revenue, uh, um, you know, over the next six to nine months, um, uh, and hopefully that will increase as we go forward. But obviously that depends on a lot of decisions by the executive around how the recovery will be phased and, and how the COVID-19 crisis itself will, will, will you know, um, um, be managed over the, over the coming months. Um, and so therefore, the, you know, we, we've got a, an estimate there of 114 to 130 million um, based on certain assumptions. Um, we're hoping to do better than that, but we really can't uh, um, give much more than that. At the minute, our revenue, as I said, we're only carrying about 10% of our normal passengers. Uh, and probably up until now, we've only been carrying maybe 5% of our normal passengers. So, our, and, and a lot of those would have been essential travel. So a lot of them would, be, would have been free travel. Um, so our revenue is, is next to nothing at this point in time. Um, but we hope to see some recovery in that at the back end of the year. And therefore, we have given an estimate to the Department of Infrastructure and the Department of Finance so that they can plan for that. Um, the, the measures that have been taken initially from the Department of Infrastructure have been very positive on the Department of Finance, and they have front-ended a lot of our uh, um, budget um, so that we're not in any, you know, we don't have a cash issue at this point in time. Um, and we're sort of in a good position, certainly for the next um, uh, four to six months. Uh, and really, it's then that we need to be starting to think about what that comes out. Our approach will be to review that those assumptions on a monthly basis, and and then make decisions on that basis as well. Okay. Now, as we've moved through this, pr this process, obviously, we were aware that Transport for London had um, furloughed uh, many of their staff, and obviously, questions were then being asked in relation to TransLink and other organisations within. Um, not only um, infrastructure, but sort of yeah. across um, the various departments, um, and opportunities have been have been looked for, particularly around um, councils and so on. Um, can I ask you about the conversations that you had with the department with regards to furlough when those were first initiated, and since then, um, what progress has been made, if any? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> shortly after the. Um, I suppose really it was around the time that Transport for London announced that they were doing furlough, and now I haven't seen the actual outcome of that. That was their original estimate of what they had furloughed, but I'm not sure how many people were actually furloughed in that case. Uh, and I suppose we've got to recognise that Transport for London are part of a local authority um, and in a very different model. They're more of a transport authority than a transport operator, so it's a very different model. But we did put uh, um, uh, our assessment of um, the appropriateness of furloughing, uh, the applicability of furloughing to TransLink, to the department, and, and we asked them for guidance. Uh, my understanding is that they sought guidance then from the Department of Finance, 
Um, and we recently received, in the last week or so, we received a letter um, from the Department which it contained that guidance from the Department of Finance, which is guidance coming from Westminster around the appropriateness of furloughing to public sector organisations. Um, and we've looked at that guidance, and it's very, very clear from the guidance that um, furloughing isn't applicable to TransLink uh, as it delivers its public transport part of its uh, business. Um, and we've replied on that basis just recently to the Department uh, that, that the furloughing as per the guidance, um, isn't applicable to, to TransLink. So you initiated the conversation as opposed to the department initiating the conversation? Well, we, we, we had heard what had happened with, uh, with Transport for London and, and we thought we'd put, you know, we, we looked ourselves to see would that be applicable to TransLink uh, and we put together what, what we thought um, was um, an assessment of the applicability to TransLink uh, and asked really the department for what their guidance on this was. As I said, that guidance really only formally was received in the last week, um, and we've responded to that guidance now. Okay, um, and I suppose whenever, when at the very at the beginning of this process, were you we asked just in relation to sort of business continuity, as opposed to where you could look for um, opportunities for to um, to furlough? Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, I think when COVID nineteen first you know, started uh, really, uh, you know, the crisis really became uh, uh, understood and, and, and actions were starting to be taken. Um, very clearly, you know, we were asked, like a lot of public services, we were asked to make sure that we maintain public service through the crisis. We were told that we could expect to see anything up to 30% absence in our business. Uh, and I think at that time we were, you know, the health minister was quoting 13,000 uh, um, deaths. and and. I suppose in the background of that, we put our plans together as to how we would maintain a public transport service during that sort of a, an environment. Uh, and that's what we maintained um, going through it. Um, the furloughing was something that happened later, if you like, in terms of uh, um, uh, you know, the appropriateness of, of furloughing to, to the public sector. And you know, at the very top of the furloughing guidance, when it first came out, it very clearly said that um, uh, it would be unlikely that public sector organisations would use it because particularly those who are delivering essential services uh, and and that's what we were you know that's what we looked at initially um, but as I said further guidance has now come out uh, and we've responded to that okay, and, we... and one of the key aspects of that guidance is that um, um, you should really only in the public sector should prefer on people uh, on the basis that you expect to be making them redundant uh, and we did not expect to be making people redundant. We were going to need a public transport network as we come out of this, and we were able to re redeploy um, all of our resources onto a lot of the measures I talked about, which was um, in providing essential services, uh, cleaning activities, um, and other sort of social distancing measures. And therefore, on that basis, the, the, it wasn't applicable to, to TransLink. Well, I'm guessing that um, councils are expecting to bring their staff back at some stage, so I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm a little unclear as to how the guidance has been, been interpreted or applied. Yeah. Um, and I'm disappointed, obviously, that, the, that you had to go to the department as opposed to them coming to you with regards to the furlough issue. Um, but again, we'll, we'll pick that up again. Um, I suppose as, as we're moving forward and we're looking towards... Um, moving towards normality, um, there will be an issue for you with regards to an increase in passengers wanting to go to work and obviously then obviously school will be starting um, as we anticipate in and around the September time. What that looks like I suppose really unclear with regards to class sizes and how that may be phased. Um, what planning is there in place at this stage with regards to that? So I mean in terms of the initial phases um, we um so we, we actually put additional capacity in place on our bus and rail network on May the 11th, so that was about a week ahead of the um, announcements by the executive. We sort of anticipated that and proactively put capacity in place to make sure that we were able to maintain social distancing. Uh, and, you know, um, leaving aside a few incidents, uh, isolated incidents that happened over the, over the weekend, um, as I said, we've been carrying about 10% of our normal passenger demand, um, and we've got about 80% of our you know, certainly a rail network and our, our metro network in place uh, and about 60% uh, uh, of, our, of our bus network, um, of our ultra bus network. Uh, that has been able to cope with the demand very well and, and we've been able to maintain social distancing and all of our services on that basis. Um, now that's something we'll keep under constant review. Um, as the phases of lockdown are announced, then we'll have to look at how we address all of those measures. Key message we're given to passengers is you know, this is like a, 
a, a combination of safety measures that people have to take. It's about hand washing, it's about sanitising, it's about um, um, social distancing, it's about wearing face coverings um, and all of those measures that all have to be taken together. Um, and a lot of it is guidance, you know, a lot of it is us issuing guidance to people, but also putting down signage and measures for people to, to, to adhere to those measures as well. Um, in terms of the Education Authority, we're, we're just now really working very closely with the Education Authority and the Department for Education and, and the Department for Infrastructure about, you know, we really need to understand their plans first to see how we, how we will manage that from a transport perspective. Uh, obviously, that will be a very challenging situation. Um, not just in context of the measures and the capacity we can put in place, but also in terms of how young people will respond to, to those measures as well. Uh, and that's something that uh, I think needs to be addressed also. Okay, and do you anticipate having to, um, I suppose, call in the services of private contract or private uh, bus companies in order to be able to ac accommodate? Yeah, that was that will be something we would consider. Um, you know, we, we um, uh, you know on two fronts. I think on one hand, if we need capacity and there's capacity there that we can't address, then obviously we can. Uh, we have we already use um, uh, private operators in our business for things like bus substitution, for example, if there's an issue in the rail network. So we have contracts in place that we can use, um, and obviously there may be a benefit to those operators as well who don't have any other work at the minute. Um, so we certainly would look at that in terms of managing capacity. Okay, uh, and just to return before I move on, just with regards to the issues at the weekend, with regards to Helens Bay and Crawfordsburn, I think people were probably quite horrified just to see the numbers of people on the beaches, never mind then when they saw the footage of the the numbers of young folk at the, the, the train stations. So yeah. obviously <clears throat> the challenges that then placed on, on, on TransLink. Yeah. What measures do you have in place and certainly you know, what support do you have for your staff um, when they're faced with um, numbers such as that in order yeah. to try to maintain social distancing as we're required to do? Well, uh, I suppose just to, just to touch on, and, and, and I know we're sort of focusing a little bit on Helens Bay, but there has been a, a sort of um, some of these issues generally across Northern Ireland. And, and I think, um, as I said earlier, we deal with many risks and hazards on our, on our public transport network on, on a daily basis, and, and COVID-19 is another one of those. Um, I think in, in these situations, where there's potential for serious overcrowding situation, we tend to work very closely with PSNI, and um, they will alert us to do what's happening in specific areas. We will know that people have maybe travelled down in small groups or in different areas. But once they're there, we know that they have to then return, and they tend to all return at the same time. Um, and to use Helen's Bay as an example, um, as soon as we were aware uh, that there's large gatherings there, and they may want to uh, use public transport on the on, on the return. Uh, we deployed staff to the area. Um, Helens Bay is obviously an unmanned um, uh, halt. Uh, we had over a dozen staff there um, by lunchtime on, uh, on Monday. Um, and uh, uh, those staff then started work with PSNI to, to put measures in place to how we were going to uh, get uh, um, um, the public transport addressed. We immediately doubled our capacity on the rail network. Um, and we also put a number of special trains on as well. But it was very clear that a lot of these young people were vulnerable young people. Um, there was a lot of uh, drink and drugs taken, um, and uh, it, they were very difficult to uh, control, even from a PSNI perspective. Um, a lot of them were starting to queue and gather at, at the halt, um, and were putting themselves into risk uh, and, and safety risk, primarily of either crushing or, or you know, falling onto tracks, for example. Uh, so. We then had to really deal with what was a, um, a public safety issue, um, uh, which took precedence over any other issue. Uh, and we agreed with the PSNI that the most important thing for us to do was to clear the area and get people away and disperse them. Um, so we arranged trains in such a way that um, uh, anyone who was using the train normally could socially distance in that. Um, but in other areas, we just had to get people onto the train and dispersed. Uh, and we did that as best as we could. Uh, we removed 1,400 uh, people from that area in a space of a few hours, um, and uh, it just shows the extent of uh, uh, the difficulty we had. But I do have to say the staff handled it extremely well. Um, a lot of staff went to that area, put themselves at personal risk to do that, uh, and managed it extremely well. Um, we will review how that went and how we will deal with it going forward. I don't think this is going to be the last time we see this, unfortunately. Um, and we will review that. I've already agreed with uh, 
uh, safety reps on trains that we will create a safe zone uh, for conductors, for example, so that if they feel comfortable with the situation, they can put themselves into a safe space and, and stay there. Um, and we will continue to, to look to methods like that to, to manage these situations. I think I would also say that, um, you know, we've had great cooperation with passengers and the majority of passengers, including young people, use our services responsibly uh, and adhere to the guidance. Um, these are isolated incidents, uh, as unfortunate as they are. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, it is an impact of young people being in, in uh, uh, lockdown for a number of months and probably for more months to come. Uh, and as we release them <laughs> to a certain extent from lockdown, we need to think about how that gets managed. Um, a lot of these young people uh, in their community, a lot of things are shut, a lot of things are closed, a lot of community groups uh, are not working at the minute uh, because of the different measures. Um, and I do think that some of this needs to be addressed at a community level uh, with a cross-agency approach uh, rather than letting it spill over uh, into a situation that, that happened over the weekend. And I suppose that's what we would like to see and certainly Translac are keen to work with community groups and with the PSNI to try and address those uh, at community level. Okay, thank you. Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. And again, like yourself, I would like to acknowledge the staff uh, who have worked tirelessly over this period of time, uh, particularly the front frontline workers. And I know in my own area, I would know most of them, a good lot of them personally. Uh, and they really have uh, been out there uh, doing their best for TransLink and for, for the public. And I have to obviously take my hat off to them at this stage. Just on the welfare side of the staff, then, is uh, what sort of uh, What's been implemented just to ensure that staff are coming through it in a, in a positive manner and come out the other side as well as their help for the staff? Well, I mean, I suppose the, the practical measures are very much around um, making sure that staff feel safe uh, while they're at work uh, and providing them with PPE, providing them with safe spaces, uh, making sure that their rest facilities, they can socially distance when uh, they're using their rest facilities. Um, and, and as I said, we've set up a number of forums with safety reps and with the unions to make sure we listen to people and understand what their concerns and issues are. And we also have a, 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 you know, relatively speaking, a large number of people who are socially isolating and who are um, shielding as well, and we're supporting those staff during that time. But on the sort of I suppose, softer side, we've also put a, a, a a lot of effort into health and well-being for staff. Um, in addition to frontline staff, we have a lot of people working from home as well. Um, so we're running webinars on uh, how to maintain their health and their well-being during this time. Uh, we've created actually an employee app, which now every employee can download, and that has a lot of information there, training information, advice about how to manage their current situation, family guidance, finance guidance, all those types of things to, to help manage their well-being. Um, so, so there's a lot of measures being in place to, to support people during this, uh, as all employers have done, uh, to make sure that you know, it's a very big change that, that has been implemented over a very short space of time, and we recognise we have a responsibility to, to, to manage those. Good. And, and just on the defence of recent days that you've alluded to there, and again, it, this is something that has happened on a regular basis, and it's been on the front line, young people before the COVID yep. situation. Yep. Has, there's been a lot of work in to try and uh, work with these large groups of, of young people who are using the facilities. There's obviously been, there's been a call overnight for a reduction in capacity. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that's the answer to these things, because yep. you do have to get them back home again and all that yes. stuff. Um, how, how do you see yourselves reaching out to the local community? There are there definitely are communities that are still working out there now, and yeah, yeah. I know their focus is on the delivery of foods and prescriptions and various things. But but there are community groups out there. If you do make an approach to, to try and help out, yeah, and and we will be reaching out to local community groups to help us in those situations because you know sometimes what you see in public transport is a reflection of what's happening in the community and, and it's really about addressing the community issue uh, rather than the, you know, the, the, uh, the symptom, if you like. Um, and we've done that very successfully in a number of areas, um, uh, touching the area, for example, in, in Lurgan, where we were doing a major piece of rail work and we wanted to make sure we worked with the local community and they understood the, the, that there would be disruption to them and, and, and the impact of that. Uh, and also very closely with the PSNI and their neighbourhood police and, and everything as well. Um, so we will continue to do that. Uh, we're doing it in a couple of areas in Belfast, uh, and certainly 
if there's any contacts or anything like that that, that you have that, that might help us uh, reach area, out, we're, we're happy to do that. If managers in certain areas were able to do that, as yes. you say, yeah. there, there is help there, yeah. and, and I don't think you should be on your own in that situation, because the welfare of the young people as well is important. Yeah, I think where we've seen maybe some issues is that um, a lot of the community groups are volunteers, and a lot of those is, have issues around um, um, isolation and shielding and things like that as well. So. Um, during the day, we can certainly talk and discuss things and how we plan things forward. But then at night time, when there's a particular incident, there maybe isn't just the same access to people. And, and uh, typically, we get very good support from community groups. Even last Thursday night, for instance, or at the 8 o'clock, when the, the, the weekly collapse on for yeah. frontline workers, the police were dealing with major incidents at the Carrick station. For instance. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just over the weekend, and I feel there's just more to come with the summer approaching yeah. and the, the good yeah. weather that we're, that we're getting and enjoying at this time. Just on the capital situation side of things, then yeah. the carriages and the bus orders. The bus orders is that locally with rights? Is that the? Well, our, we we currently have a framework contract uh, with Right Bus. So um, for the low emission vehicles, um, we would be using that framework with rights. Yeah. Like, where does the carriages and where, where are they being ordered from? The, the train carriages you refer to. The train carriages are from CAF. That's our current supplier. They come from Spain. Spanish. Yeah, yeah, Spanish company. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chris, for your answers. Uh, my question sort of follows on from the Chair's point uh, and a further one, but it's more so you referred to your percentage, was it 5%, you know, up to approximately 10 Was there any reduction in salaries or wages at all across TransLink? Not, obviously, it's not a direct comparison to what, with your kind of people, but what was the percentage reduction in wages or salary? Well, uh, out to your staff? Th 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 there was no reduction in basic salary to people. Uh, um, but obviously, when we're running a full schedule service, um, you create flexibility in how you do that by having what we would call sort of sh you know different hours. So people would have um, uh, maybe maximum hours contracts, for example. Uh, they would only be working at basic hours now. So we would be seeing a reduction in our uh, in our um, a salary bill, if you like, uh, on the basis of working a, a totally different shift pattern. And and what would that be, Chris? What you know, percentage um, roughly? Um, well, we, we would probably, in, in total terms, our savings around our network at the minute is probably running at about about uh, two hundred fifty thousand um, pounds. You know, on a on a sort of weekly basis. Um, so uh, per week. So per week, yeah. You know, on the basis of the service that we're currently running. So we have implemented, you know, cost reductions as a result of the service we were actually running. Um, but as I'd said earlier, furloughing and using the furloughing scheme. It is very clear from the guidance that we now have that that is not applicable to, to TransLink. So what's that 250k per week? What's that roughly in percentage terms? What is your roughly your salary per week? I couldn't quote that off the top of my head no, what it is, you know, what, what that is. Yeah. Maybe, there's no panic now, maybe you can get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. to know That's what fine. the correlation yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough. Next point, and I suppose the Chair touched on it briefly, what's your modelling going forward? Let's say schools in September, whatever yeah. that may be, yeah. or indeed capacity changes from 10% back to 100%. So if mm -hmm. a bus takes 52 or 42, whatever the number is, yeah, yeah. what do you see that being on a bus? Whether it be school children or pensioners, it doesn't matter. What do you yeah. see that model being on a, on a what was a previously full bus till now a, a COVID bus, we'll call it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, we're working very closely with DFT, who have you know travel safe guidance and the Department of Infrastructure and the Public Health Agency. Right now, we you know we've got good measures in place to manage social distancing, and, and that's our, our key priority. This is a very dynamic situation, and we're going to have to manage that uh, on a week-to-week -week basis, on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, I do think you're right that the key time for us will be <coughs> when schools return in September, uh, and how we manage that. And we, we really have just entered into discussions with the Education Authority and the Department for Education on how that's going to be managed. Um, uh, the whole issue around social distancing and, and how that's managed uh, going forward as well is, you know, is, is still being debated uh, in, in, in the longer term. Um, so we'll work very closely with all of those to find out how we how we manage this going forward. It, you know, it, it, a lot of employers are saying that well, really, they don't see people necessarily returning to work uh, on a full time basis, uh, or returning to the office, I should say, on a full time basis for months to come. Uh, and we'll have to review how, how that actually plays out. It's, it's important you don't fall into the same trap as Aer Lingus. You know, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Suddenly the, the workers go back to work and the buses just fall. You know, so it's yeah, well, well no, we, we, we currently have... 
you, you can't put guidance on uh, um, on, a, on a particular uh, um, that, that covers all vehicle types, if yeah. you like, because it's very different on depending on the vehicle type. But you know, w you know, we've worked on the basis at the minute that you know uh, that you know our drivers and our conductors have guidance around the amount of people that you could typically carry on a particular uh, vehicle, and. Uh, to adhere to social distancing, and, and we're currently carrying that and less probably at the minute. Um, I think as we start to get to a situation where we start to breach that, and um, that's when we'll start looking at what what other measures we can put in place. Okay, then um, the NHS staff and the, the travelling free and was what's the take up? Have you any way of monitoring what the take up was in that? Or, you, you know, and how do, how does an NHS person get onto the bus? Do they have to provide some sort of identification or what? Yeah, they typically it's it, we worked with the um, part for health about what would be the best way to manage it. So certainly, if, if people work in the NHS, they just use their staff pass. If people work in the care centre, uh, they can get a letter from the Department for Health, uh, and with uh, you know any form of ID, we'll accept that along with the letter from the Department of Health. So there are a number of different ways that people can identify themselves. Um, I, we would say, um, you know, even during the. Um, uh, you know, during April, I suppose when we were seeing, you know, at the height of of the crisis, we were we were still seeing about eighty thousand journeys a week on public transport. Now, bear in mind that would have been millions in the, in the yeah. past, but um, and the large majority of those would have been essential workers. Uh, we'd say probably about two thirds health uh, workers, and then the rest um, retail and and food supplies. Um, okay, and final question is the soft question. We'd like to hear. Yeah. Uh, no change policy. What is that got in terms of money for charities? Have you any idea figures yet? I don't have a figure on that. I mean, it, it's a relatively small amount at this point because, as I said, a lot of essential workers are using the, the service free up to date, um, and most other people who are regular users who are using the service know are very familiar with M Link and I Link and all our different Smart Link cards, uh, and they're able to use that. So it's it's relatively small number of people uh, using cash, but I wouldn't have a figure on it at this stage. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. And thank you very much, Chris, for the update. Right. And I share some of the commentary in terms of the work the staff has done and pass that on <coughs> to the, the committee and the good work that getting the key workers and everybody across. And I just a couple of points, obviously. I don't want to blame the youth. I think the, the issue for us all is a broader societal challenge yeah. Yeah. You know, to, um, to, to deal with that and address it. I, I think it's I think we've done fairly well, to be honest with you. Society here has done fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, it's been locked down for 10 weeks, so we, we understand. So yeah. just one wouldn't be picking on the youth all the time. All, all the members may have different views. But um, just in general, I mean, I'm trying just following on from the, the actual physical side of things in terms of social distance. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a 50 seater bus. I mean, mm -hmm. one is, you know, are you looking at any innovative ways in terms of? Physically doing something in terms of like standing room only, or, or you know, I mean, I know that's to say maybe yeah, yeah, safety yeah. issue, and and how then you protect your um, the drivers. Mm -hmm. The other couple of issues going on following on from that is whose responsibility, you know, you know, the enforcement of it. I mean, surely it's not down to the driver to say mm -hmm. you know do this or do that. I mean, and and what guidance or what support you've had from the department in relation, mm -hmm. and I'll also just pick up has there been any breaches in relation to. To any in relation to your buses or any yeah. things, you know, just those are a couple of quick points. Um, so I suppose our 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 approach is, is firstly to, you know, work with um, the executive department of infrastructure and the public health agency, you know, in terms of you know their advice and their guidance. We've also been involved in uh, working with the industry more widely in in the UK. So you know, department for transport, um, and also. Organisations like the Confederation for Public Transport in the UK who are looking at this UK-wide uh, and talking to all operators. We've been on teleconferences with them, looking at the types of things they are trying to do, and also UITP, which is a European-wide public transport organisation, um, taking advice from countries who have maybe are ahead of us in terms of uh, their um, uh, recovery from from COVID-19. So we've been looking at a lot of that, uh, and also talking to our colleagues, obviously in Bus Air and in Irish Rail and, and Dublin Bus as well, and looking at that. And it's a bit like all of these things; everyone has a different approach to it, um, and there are lots of different views out there about what works and what doesn't work. Mm. And there are pros and cons for every measure you try to take. Um, we know ourselves when you when you try to put a something in place to manage one safety risk, you sometimes create another risk somewhere else. And, and so therefore, you have to decide what's, what's, what's uh, um, 
important. And I think you touch on an important point there as well. Um, the whole issue of enforcement. You know, if you're going to put measures in place, um, primarily for trans like their guidance, um, you know, we don't have enforcement powers. Uh, we can't enforce certain things. I mean, that's, that's a rule for base and I. Uh, and, and even within the social distancing regulations, there's different views on what can be enforced and what can't be enforced. Um, so yes, we, don't, we, we have to take that into consideration with any measures we put in place. We don't want to put our staff in a situation where they're in confrontation with passengers or they're trying to enforce something which is ill, Ill thought through. Um, so all of those aspects have to be considered, and, and of course, you know, I, I should have mentioned uh, as well, working with our union and, and consulting with the union in this. So th there is DFT guidance out on safe travel, and, and that's primarily where we've been taking our guidance from, um, along with the Department for Infrastructure. And I know the Department of Infrastructure are keen to, to start thinking about some guidance around safe travel for, for Northern Ireland as well, uh, and we'll be working closely with them on that too, uh, and consulting with the union on it. Um, I, I would say that this is a a go forward situation. You know, right now we have capacity in place to manage social distancing. We are not seeing, other than some isolated instances which we've talked about over the weekend, we're not really seeing breaches of that. Um, I would say that we are not seeing a big take up. We are encouraging people to wear face coverings when they're using public transport, but we're not seeing a big take up of that at all. Um, and I, I do think that all of these measures need to be taken in combination. You know, it's not one one measure to to look at any safety risk, you always look at a combination of things. Um, so I suppose, you know, we will continue to do that, continue to review that. Um, uh, I think we'll have to watch closely in the summer now. It, it appears that leisure travel will be a bigger issue for us than, than commuting. Uh, and that's something we're very conscious of now. Uh, and we're going to have to look at that. Um, and um, I think September will be the key challenge as, as schools return and, and perhaps when school children go back, some people might return to work as well, um, rather than working from home. Um, so I, I think that's something we need to start getting ready for now and start proactively plan for. And, and just in, in in terms of physics, I mean, most of the buses is one entrance, entrance and exit. Yeah. One, you know, it's not like some of the other countries would do. Yeah. Um, and, and that is a challenge for us. And I mean, we need clear guidance, mm -hmm. and we need the department to work with yourselves in terms of giving that, getting the message. Out. Just following on from that, and I mean, we've talked in the past, the last time I had a conversation, we talked about active travel, and we, we had a yeah. debate here recently about the, the economic recovery. Um, and I know that you've done the, the hydrogen, you mentioned the hydrogen buses, um, the hydrogen pilot. Yeah. And obviously, things haven't worked so well with the COVID. Just can you give me a wee bit of an update on that and, and where you see all of that going forward? And yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 look, we're very clear that post COVID 19, the climate crisis, and clean air issues are still there. Um, you know, the, uh, the, um, the Department for Health in uh, England has, um, uh, you know, stated that uh, air quality is, you know, the biggest environmental health risk, um, and they've estimated that um, the, the sort of approximate um, deaths per year as 30,000 um, from air quality issues. Um, so we've got to be very conscious of that. It's also an invisible risk out there that people aren't always aware of. Um, so we see this as maybe an opportunity to accelerate uh, a number of those sustainable transport initiatives. Um, obviously, the, the, the minister is, is uh, uh, taking uh, action around sustainable transport like uh, cycling and walking. Uh, and has created a cycling and walking unit uh, uh, with a champion. Uh, and TransLink are members of that unit as well. We'll, we'll be contributors to that too. Um, but we also want to then accelerate what we're doing with uh, low and zero emission vehicles. Um, we announced the pilot with um, uh, Right Bus and Energia um, a number of months ago, and I suppose we would have hoped those buses would have been in service by now, uh, but also with COVID-19 that's been delayed uh, probably to the end of this year. Um, but we'd like to accelerate the uh, bus ordering uh, um, for um, more hydrogen vehicles and for uh, electric vehicles as well. Uh, and we think there's potential to order maybe 100 vehicles over the next 12 months. Uh, and that would go a long way to um, addressing quali uh, air quality issues in Belfast and in Derry, London Derry. Uh, and we would target those two urban areas really um, for, for low emission vehicles um, in support of other initiatives that are ongoing from the councils and from the minister uh, around uh, sustainable transport and looking at 
face making in those areas as well that's more geared to um, places where people want to, to live and work rather than <coughs> places where uh, there's a lot of uh, emissions from from cars and just finally chair and I, I mean you're working closely with the department to get the campaigns yeah. on okay thank you chair you. miss anderson uh, thank you, and uh, I concur with what you said about the vast majority of young people um, acting responsibly, but unfortunately that's not the case uh, for all, and I want to extend uh, my thanks as well to, to TransLink staff. You mentioned about uh, face masks, and it's recommended that we, we wear face covering on public transport, although the union has said it should be compulsory. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just a recommendation. And given the fact that you're saying, look, there's not a big uptake in this recommendation, it's, uh, it's to get your own view with regards to what the union is saying, look, unless we move to a stage where this is going to be compulsory, it's only going to be a recommendation falling on deaf ears. Yeah. So. I'm not going to get drawn into a policy issue because I think that whether it's mandatory or recommended is is a government policy issue or not. Um, what you know, what our view on it is is that to keep you know, like, it's like any safety measure, and we we put a, we have a lot of hazards in our business, and we have to put uh, safety measures in place to manage those risks. Uh, and you tend to take multiple approaches to it. You know, it's a bit like you know, driving your car. You have a seatbelt, you have airbags, you have crush zones. You you have multiple approaches to how you manage risk. Uh, and we feel that um, the multiple approach is hand washing, it is hand sanitizers, it is us cleaning our facilities on a regular basis and, and hygiene cleaning during the day. Uh, it is about PPE for our staff um, uh, and it is about social distancing but also uh, face covering and we think all of those measures taken together will give the best um, um, safety for, for passengers and for our staff and will make public transport a safe place for people to use. Um, and, and I suppose that's, that's what we'd recommend to our passengers. I think it's for uh, um, the government really to decide whether that becomes mandatory or, or, or recommended. I certainly um, uh, use public transport and, and use a mask and try to show that leadership. And we have issued PPE to all our staff as well. And we just need to continue to do that uh, and show that sort of leadership. Yeah, I'm just conscious of what the, the union has said, particularly given that there is such um, a low take up yeah. on the wearing of masks and if you were observing well people aren't using hand sanitizers and uh, people aren't washing their hands yeah. people aren't wearing masks if that were the case for instance yeah. you would have to take uh, yeah. further action so it's just something that must be kept uh, under review you talked about the recovery and uh, post-covid and um, obviously because of the downturn in the number of people who are using uh, transportation at this moment in time, particularly across the island, um, I haven't been receiving um, as many complaints, um, in fact none since, uh, since the uh, lockdown. Uh, but I'm still getting contacted by people who had been in touch with me, so I'm going to return to an issue around the recovery and post-COVID, as you had talked about. As I had said at the, the, the last time I engaged with you, Chris, the, uh, the power of law enforcement uh, to stop people, to seek papers, to, uh, to confirm identity, mm -hmm. given that the common travel area is very clear, mm -hmm. both from the law on the Irish side and the law on the British side, uh, with regards to that. Um, the last time that you were at the committee, I, I had raised this and I had a number of, of questions around the particularly the buses uh, around the all ireland transport following our exchange uh, somewhat surprised uh, to see a spokesperson come out from translink uh, to correct what i had said uh, which would be okay if it were true uh, because they released a statement uh, to say mm. that uh, they stated the checks had not increased very emphatically uh, had not increased so um, i am asking just what evidence has TransLink uh, for, because there was no evidential base mm -hmm. used in the statement that was released, other than to say that uh, there was no increase. So, Martina, forgive me, I'm not familiar with that particular okay. uh, um, uh, statement, and I would have to check that to, to, to clarify that for you, and happy to do that afterwards. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, um, it's not something we're counting to, to, to check the number, if you like. Uh, um, um, and I suppose 
I could only uh, guess at this point of view that, that it was referring to that we haven't noticed a significant increase in this, but I will check the statement to, just to see what was there, and I can certainly get back to you directly on that. Um, as you rightly say, we're not, it's not an issue right now, um, and um, we're certainly very happy to work with um, PSNI, uh, Gardy, uh, and uh, others about what the right advice and guidance is in these situations. At the minute, we're, we just respond to um, uh, the enforcement powers that, that uh, the PSNI or Gardy have are um, to, to stop a service and to board a service, and, and uh, you know that's not. We don't really get into the realms of, of what they do whenever they're undertaking that activity, or or the rel or, or, or um, how appropriate that activity is. Um, but we're happy to work with anyone in terms of the right guidance on this and and and, and support uh, and whatever approach is deemed appropriate going forward. Yeah, well, I appreciate the fact you can get back to me on that because I would be absolutely appalled if it was just because somebody didn't notice, mm -hmm. uh, that as opposed to any evidential basis yeah, okay. uh, for a statement to, to go out. But I, I accept the fact you'll come back to me on that, Chris, you don't have that information. Um, the concern has not just been raised by Sinn Féin, but also by organisations like the, community, the Committee of the Administration for Justice, uh, particularly around complaints that have been received around potential uh, racial profiling on this issue. And when you were last at the committee, you had stated that you are acquired by law. And I'm trying to ascertain, as someone who had been a former member of the policing board and would be very aware of the law enforcement around stop and search, I'm trying to ascertain uh, where that law is. Uh, that allows immigration officers to board buses in the context of the common travel area mm -hmm. um, and buses going from Derry to Dublin or, or Belfast to Dublin. Um, so I'm just wanting to ensure that TransLink isn't voluntarily um, facilitating uh, this process without having carried okay. out an equality impact assessment. And I have no problem uh, with this process taking place, so long, uh, so long it is in within the law, and that people have got um, a course to redress if mm -hmm. they feel, for instance, that there's a trend and a pattern mm -hmm. developing that may need to be investigated. And that's why I think it is crucially important that, for instance, TransLink would log this. I can imagine, just as you said earlier, if something was to happen in a bus or train and the consequence of emerging from this lockdown or as we are you know, easing off the restrictions and people travelling, I can imagine for bus drivers, if for instance they're asked to pull in, if someone is taken off a bus having paid to go to a destination, if, for instance, their their luggage, that but it, the very me, minimum I, would have to be would have to be logged. So, I'm just so I wouldn't, just find wouldn't out mind for keeping items. your comments in relation to the COVID response and recovery. Well, this is about the recovery and coming back, and this is about all Ireland travel and coming from a constituency where we do travel from Derry to Belfast uh, and on to Dublin, and from Derry to Dublin and Belfast to Dublin post recovery. I don't want a continuation of a situation that we had prior to. So this is about the recovery. Uh, yeah, and making sure those guidance aren't yeah. is and, and look, I, so so I suppose my commitment is I, I I'll, we'll look at that press statement certainly and we're happy to work with you on this do you know what I mean and, okay. and look at how okay. we make sure that one the legislation is understood and that we adhere to the legislation and all of those aspects uh, we're, we're happy to look so maybe I'll have an engagement with yourselves yeah, we can, yeah, and we can one do one along well. with perhaps okay. an organisation like CAJ and others. I'll pick that up. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Muir. Thank you very much. And for the record, I would declare I was previously an employee of TransLink. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, and echo the words of other members of staff for all the work that they've done, particularly over recent days. I saw what was happening down in Helens Bay, and there was a significant deployment of staff, and I really do appreciate that. Um, you're right in saying that it's not just isolated to one area. Uh, Mr Hilditch has outlined other areas where it's been a concern, and as people of all ages, um, not really shown the level of constraint and just flocking to those destinations. I think one of the concerns that was raised with me from residents was um, around the rules or regulations that quite significant volumes were getting on um, at halts. Um, so if they're getting on at unstaffed halts, and I understand there's a limitation there because the conductor obviously is in a very difficult position, mm -hmm. but if they're getting on at staffed halts, you know, such as Great Victoria Street, whether there's anything within the regulations or any rules to stop conveying just the volumes there. So I understand the limitations around that, and yeah. I do really appreciate what's been done, but just to see if there's anything around that. Uh, and just two other things. Um, you mentioned the no change policy. Mm -hmm. I understand why that's been put in place, but just give a bit more about that and whether there's any sort of long-term 
views about continuing that. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one's really working from home. Uh, I've seen more of my apartment than I have in the last seven years, in the last <laughs> couple of weeks. <laughs> and uh, I, I, some of us are adapting to it, and I think there's a, a, a mix, you know, I think, you know, working from home sometimes, but then getting out is probably yeah. a, a balance. It's how you're going to adapt to that in public transport, because, you know, I can remember some services leaving Bangor in the mornings, and they're absolutely packed, and whether mm -hmm. if people then are going to decide they're going to work from home two days a week, what that's going to have an effect on in terms of long-term passenger numbers yeah. um, as we go forward. I'll try to remember all these questions yes. now. <laughs> I'll go back. So we'll go back to the beginning. Okay. Um, um, look, you know, when there's an incident like happened over the last few days, we log that as a safety incident, uh, and we will then do a review of, of what steps we could take to to stop prevent it happening again. Uh, and we will do that. Um, um, uh, and we will also uh, part of that we will review with PSI uh, measures we can take. Um, you know. PSI have been extremely supportive, and um, you can see maybe on social media over the weekend the PSI have been travelling on our trains and travelling to all the spots <coughs> that we sit down together and identify could be a risk. Uh, the chief constable himself was on on the train as well at the weekend, um, showing that level of support. So, so we're you know that that works well, um, uh, and. You know, sometimes getting early intelligence about what might be happening is sometimes the way we work, and, and we can then put people on the ground to try and uh, manage that. Um, and uh, obviously, alcohol is not allowed on our, particularly on our rail service and any of our services. Uh, and we would put staff on the ground to to remove uh, alcohol, and that can sometimes help the situation as well. So there are lots of measures that we have experience of using before in big in, uh, in big events, for example, uh, and we will look to deploy some of those. Um, but there is a risk that this could be a long, hot summer, and and you know th these issues could could continue, um, and we will be looking at all the measures that we can take. But we will need support from other groups as well, which is my key point around community groups stopping people <coughs> travelling in the first place yes. uh, and having things for them to do in the community before they they, they get somewhere else, uh, and obviously you know, support from PSNI and other areas and other agencies perhaps involved in that too. Um, uh, on terms of the change situation, so you know we see a big opportunity to, uh, or always have done, to move to contactless and, and to um, to remove, you know, to, to reduce the number of cash. We know there are groups that will always need to use cash, and, and that's 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 fine from a from an equality perspective. We will always have that facility there, um, but we are working with our. Uh, uh, ticketing supplier at the minute to see can we uh, accelerate as well as we talked about accelerating some you know uh, um, low emission vehicles and things like that can we accelerate some of our contactless ticketing solutions um, to because we've seen a big uptake in contactless I, I don't think I've used cash myself in the last two months um, and if we could accelerate that that would be very helpful um, we'll certainly keep the no change uh, uh, facility in place for now uh, and we'll probably review that at the end of the summer um, I think for young people it can be a challenge, um, and you know that, that's probably not an issue right now. But but as schools go back and things like that, we, you know we'll need to consider whether that's appropriate or not uh, for young people. So we will have a look at that. Um, in terms of the long-term view, it, it's 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 hard to gauge. You know, uh, um, I, I suppose through my career I've, I've lived through certain crises and different things, and everybody always says, "Oh, it's all going to change. It'll never be the same again." And invariably. It, it, it goes back. Um, so I suppose we're trying to do whatever we can to, to make some behavioural change during this period. So when people return, it's different. Um, but certainly, if you look at Northern Ireland, our um, passenger journeys per head of population was around 45. Um, um, and when you compare that to the likes of London and places like that, where we'll be well over 100 uh, passenger journeys per head of population, it's a very different scenario we're in. So, uh, you know, even in a uh, post-COVID scenario, I, I think we'll still need to increase public transport and, and get more people using public transport uh, and sustainable transport going forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Beggs. Hello. Uh, again, thanks, Chris, for your presentation. And I would firstly like to ask you to pass on my appreciation to your staff for the essential work that they do as essential workers, as they help other essential workers and, indeed, the rest of um, business get, get back to some degree of normality. Um, regarding uh, protection of your staff, um, there were a number of fatalities in London thought to be related to contact with, with the public and uh, protections were, were required. Have all 
the lessons been learned from London so that your staff are protected as much as can be possible? Yeah, I mean, I've listed through a lot of measures that we've we've taken for our staff, and um, you know, it's very sad to see that uh, um, I think it was over 30 deaths in uh, Transport for London um, uh, uh, with frontline workers, uh, mostly with frontline workers. Uh, we um, are, I suppose, thankful that we haven't seen that situation because of the measures that we've put in place. Uh, we have seen, out of a staff of 4,000 staff, we, we've seen less than 10 uh, positive COVID-19 cases. Um, so that, I think, is testament to the measures that we've put in place, uh, along with really good support from, from our unions and from our, our safety representatives uh, as well. Um, and, and I think we continue to do that. We want to see that sort of level of, of safety continued. Uh, and we will, you know, I think this will be a dynamic situation. We're always going to have to look for new measures and new things to manage on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis. And we certainly have a commitment to, to work with our staff to continue to do that. Uh, what sort of numbers of staff have had the shield because of another family member? That may be um, at, at this point in time, we have about 300 staff who are either self-isolating or shielding, um, and sometimes. There can be a blur between those, but, but uh, around that sort of members. Um, at, uh, at the peak, it was probably between five and 600. Uh, Turning to the, the, the furloughing scheme, which potentially can help maximise your income and mm -hmm. enable you to employ more staff throughout the, throughout the year, yeah. I, I'm, I don't quite understand why you're, you're, you feel you're not entitled to it. Have you received a concrete insurance that you will receive the £114 million that you need this year to continue to employ your staff all year, from either the finance minister yeah, or the yeah. infrastructure minister. Well, the the um, I mean the guidance is very clear, and I suppose it would take a long time for me to go through all the guidance here. But uh, there is a letter from the Department of Finance which clearly sets out the guidance, and I'm sure the members could get access to that. And and we have assessed that guidance for Translink and and. and view that it's not applicable for people who are delivering the, 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 the public transport network uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if we look then at the, um, the, the funding required going forward, um, we, uh, we have, I suppose we take comfort from the fact, uh, and that's all I can say at the minute, that the executive have committed to maintain the public transport network and see the, urgent, the necessity of maintaining the public transport network going forward. Uh, and, and you know, Translink is the main operator of that public transport network. Um, so uh, we take some comfort from that. Uh, we understand that there are uh, measures um, that the executive are taking, the Department of Finance are taking, which are phased. So we've seen some of that. So we've seen the, the budget commitments. We've also seen the um, uh, 30 million that was announced recently, um, and that is, you know, the. Uh, th there will be other decisions, I assume, taken after that. Uh, we also understand that there are other decisions that will need to be taken in Westminster, which will have Barnet consequentials from a transport perspective as well, and the Department of Finance, I'm, I'm sure, will want to wait to see what, what those are as well and how that affects its budget. So we I say we take comfort from what the Executive is doing at the minute. Uh, we recognise we need to work very closely together. Um, and I, I think, like a lot of businesses, it's a very dynamic situation at the minute, and we're going to have to manage it uh, that way. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I think we should be pursuing exactly why uh, Translink are not entitled to, to gain additional funds through furloughing, uh, if that will improve the financial situation. Um, fa final point then, in terms of um, contactless payment or cash, avoiding cash payment. Um, um, cash results in delays in public transport, and also there's there's a very obvious uh, potential health risk as well with transmission. Mm -hmm. Of, of, of a virus. So have you looked at using financial incentives to encourage even more people uh, in the future to use contactless train payment, which will help your staff and help uh, public transport uh, keep its schedules? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's already significant advantages to people using uh, contactless. You know, for example, if you use a smart card, um, there's a, around 25% reduction, you know, on your uh, total costs uh, by doing that, because you top it up with, them, with multiple journeys, obviously, and that creates a benefit. Uh, and there are, you know, benefits on, on a number of our other contactless solutions as well. Um, uh, and, and yes, I suppose we can look at that, you know, to see is there any additional incentives we can do um, to, to address that. Um, 
but I, w I would say that there are sections of our community who are still very cash dependent and for, you know and will be for a long time uh, and we've, we're, we will always have to cater for that we know that there are some areas for example in London where they're cashless they don't have any cash um, and uh, um, you know that certainly would be an ambition but but I think we're we're a little bit away from that yet and um, particularly with some social groups who, who require access to cash um, but it's certainly something we can review. There's already significant discounts there, I would say, um, and we've got to be careful when you put discounts in, they're very hard to get them removed again at, at, at a time in the future, but it's something we can review, yeah. But it's almost actually increasing the price for those that are using cash to reflect the cost that it is on the company and encourage that movement. It's amazing how much people move because of financial incentives. Look at the, the plastic bag tax, amazing effect yeah. that that small yeah. charge had. Well, certainly, yeah, we'll, we'll take that on board. Uh, you know, okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Chris, for your update. And, and like the others, just to extend my gratitude to Translink staff, particularly um, over the last while, and it has been very challenging. No, my own area, there's been quite an influx of people to, to beauty spots and things, so we know mm -hmm. it's probably an issue right across. I just have um, one or two questions here. Um, you I, I am aware that there, there are maybe additional fleet um, on standby for to try and deal with capacity issues. So it's just to get a wee bit more information on that um, and how going forward you foresee um, TransLink utilising that. And um, I know my colleague had, had mentioned around innovative ways of dealing with social distancing and that going forward. Have, the have TransLink considered seat removal, particularly, you know, as we look at, you know, and I know you'd said about... Um, trying to manage young kids on, on school buses and things like that, it might be something to consider if they haven't already, um, you know, as a way of physically nearly keeping keeping people apart. Um, and just one other one is, it's really, I suppose, looking at, you know, those people who who are particularly reliant on public transport for essential journeys. Um, so as restrictions ease, and, I'm, you know, we hope to see a bigger uptake in public transport, um, you know, a, as we go through that. Have we any way, because there will still be capacity issues in how many people can go on the bus and things like that, is there any way of, of managing that, you know, those people who need it the most will be able to access it as they need it, you know? Yeah. Is there any way of managing that, or is that something that, that these are considering? Well, I suppose, um, uh, start at the beginning in terms of how we manage standby, so uh, what we're effectively doing is, on a shift basis, we will have a number of standby drivers for, for each shift, and we will have standby vehicles available. Uh, and it's, it's mostly in an urban setting, so it's mostly in, in metro, for example, or on a, a railway. Uh, and if any um, uh, driver or um, staff member has a concern about maybe the number of people at a stop or the number of people they've had to pick up on a previous service, they will contact control. Control will then uh, notify the inspectors to put out an additional bus on that particular route, and there'll be a standby driver available to do that. Okay. And that's the way we've operated it, and that has worked quite successfully um, so far. And, um, uh, and it tends to be, we have very few instances, but where anybody has a concern, it tends to be a little bit of peak travel sometimes in, in the early morning um, on the evening. And again, that's where we would be encouraging some behaviour change. And, and I know employers are looking at this as well to say that people would go back to work, but maybe not all, at, you know, start at nine o'clock in the morning again, that there would be a phase start for people between eight and nine and ten. And that would allow us to... Uh, it, it's actually a more efficient way to run our public transport network because we can actually have, rather than having a lot of services available at peak and then very little off peak, yeah. we can actually run services more more consistently yeah. across the day. Um, so that certainly would be something we'd be encouraging employers to look at as well. In terms of, I mean, as I said, there are pros and cons for every measure you put in place to manage social distancing, uh, and uh, um, uh, lots of operators are looking at it in different ways. Um, uh, the approach we've taken to date has worked well. Uh, and we're just going to review those approaches going forward. Um, I think one of the key areas is there are countries that are ahead of us in this, in Europe particularly, and we have access to an organisation called UITP, which is an international trade body uh, across Europe, and, and we're looking at what those countries have done and what works well. Um, uh, and I suppose we just have to keep that under review as we go forward, and obviously working closely with the Department of Infrastructure on that. Um, Forgive me, I forget. It was just about the essential journeys. Is there any way of managing it, I suppose, as, e as lockdown um, eases? Um, it would be very difficult at the minute for us to try and identify who's essential and who's not essential. And again, you get into that situation as who's got the responsibility to enforce that. And a lot of our services, you've maybe got one bus driver or one conductor on the train. 
and, and for them to try and enforce that with lots of different people uh, would be very difficult. Again, what we're really our message is to passengers is to look help us to help you yeah. be respectful to other people and think about your journey and think about how you could do it differently. And you know, if you are to stop and there's maybe a lot of people there or the bus is busy, wait for the next service uh, and, and, and sort of try to try to show that. And, and I would say that the majority of our passengers are doing that and and are looking at different times of travel and particularly in the evening peak as well and looking at doing things differently. Um, so. I suppose I wouldn't want a few small incidents to all, uh, undo all the good work that's, that's already been going on between ourselves, our staff, and with passengers. Yeah, no, and I appreciate. It. I think uh, you know, right across the board, that's something that even the executive message. It's you know, there's only so much people can put in place that it, there is a responsibility on people too. So it's getting that message yeah, right. Yeah. Just a small point, I suppose, it leads on from um, Mr. Beggs as well in terms of the furlough, and um, and I would be keen to explore that and find out what you know what, what, how Translink haven't been able to access that scheme, particularly as councils have been able to, to access it and I'm sure a lot of them are in the same position as yourself so it's really just to support um, Mr Pegg's proposal there and hopefully we can get some answers for you. So. Okay. okay, thank you Chris, thanks Chair. Thank you Ms Kelly. Uh, thanks very much and thanks Chris. Chris, uh, I, I don't envy the task of anyone having to try to plan for the new normal, it's such a yeah. new world for us all. Um, in relation to the Helens Bay uh, uh, incident. I, I want to commend Translink for the way in which they handle the situation. I spoke to the Chief Constable on Monday and he, I think, was on one of the trains going out and he, he said that it's, uh, it's a bit like, you know, you sort of call a policeman for a particular incident and then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I understand that everything, actually uh, getting people home safely, there was no major incidents, if any, mm -hmm. at all uh, with the young people. And Miss Anderson's right. <coughs> Majority of young people are very sensible. But, you know, I think there, there is an issue around uh, society and parental responsibility. I mean, I got calls the other evening about young people gathering at the, the lakes in Lurgan, and one of the fathers dropped his 15-year-old off with a bottle of vodka. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said yeah, for holding yeah. people to account. Um, and, and like others, I'd want to put on record uh, our thanks to the Translink staff uh, for uh, continuing to operate uh, during these very difficult times. I, I am interested, just, uh, just out of curiosity more than anything else, in relation to the concessionary fares and whether there's been significant fall-off in that income, because that would tell me that people were abiding by the guidelines, but they're not making mm. unnecessary journeys in, in many cases, outside of those additional measures around health and social care, you know, and essential workers who were becoming entitled, if you like, yeah. to free travel. Um, yeah. I, I, the simple answer is yes, we have a huge drop off in, in, in our um, concessionary fares. Um, a lot of those people would be shielding or, or, mm -hmm. and, and that happened. There would be some very small isolated cases where people are very lonely and okay. they wanted to continue to travel and take that risk and sometimes our staff would be a bit concerned about those individuals and would be recommending that they shouldn't really be doing this um, so there's a very small number of isolated cases like that um, but generally speaking yes there's been a big drop on concessionary fares uh, and can i ask then in, in relation to your contract with the <coughs> department of education given that schools mm -hmm. aren't opening uh, do, does transing continue to get paid for the school transport provision well, Transix is in the same position as private operators on that yeah. stage, that, uh, and the you know the sort of uh, guidance was that uh, th those uh, facilities should continue to be paid for mm -hmm. uh, to allow those operators to maintain the service and be be ready for when the recovery happens. Um, so uh, that was maintained in the same way as it was maintained for private operators. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, in relation to face masks, I know that the minister has met with the union, and again, the unions are very firm on the idea that they ought to be mandatory and not. Mm -hmm as currently the case, the Minister's advice being voluntary. But I understand that there's a, 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 where the Ministers are awaiting uh, further guidance from the Department of Health and the Economy as to whether or not to make it mandatory. And some, <coughs> there would nearly need to be an all-island approach too, as well, in yeah. relation to that. What discussions, if any, have there been held in relation to that? Well, we, you know, we, we've, we're just following the PHA guidance at the minute. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, there are some issues with mandatory as well in terms of who places that then and, yeah. and the enforcement of all of that and, and how you do that too. So mm -hmm. we'd be concerned about some of those aspects of it. Okay. Uh, um, you know, uh, but it is also, 
you know, there is a behavioural aspect to this as well. I think a lot of people feel very uncomfortable wearing masks and, and culturally it's not something... That I know. Really, I know. Um, uh, and I think all of that, you know, would need to be addressed as well. So. Well, the jury's still out, I think. And, and I think, yeah, yeah, you're right. I think we, we tend to work closely with the different agencies and take their advice. Uh, and as you say, people have different views on this. Well, could I just finish on... Um, I want to thank the, the staff, in, uh, particularly in the Lurgan area, uh, particularly around North Lurgan, where there was major capital investment... Mm -hmm. But because of the engagement with the local community by uh, your officers and uh, uh, your partners, yeah. actually was managed very, very well. Uh, but the, the Belfast Transport Hub and the potential to create 400 jobs uh, in terms of the, that's over the next five years, mm -hmm. the oversight of that in terms of uh, the new normal, I take it that that will be worked alongside with the Confederation of, for the construction industry. Yes. Oh, yeah. And it, would they then have the responsibility for ensuring any health and safety executive guidelines are implemented? Well, well the, the, the contractors themselves have uh, very clear guidance from CEF and from the health and safety executive around the measures they should be taking. Uh -huh. um, but in addition to that, we ha have instigated uh, regular safety audits on any of our sites okay. um, to ensure that, that all the measures have been taken appropriately, um, not just social distancing, but other measures yeah. as well. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we feel our contractors and suppliers are very responsible in this. Mm -hmm. in this or in the construction industry is well regarded for managing safety and managing mm -hmm. risk, and, and they're taking the same approach to they do in other areas to, to COVID-19 as well. Uh, and we've seen a very good response from them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Just a wee quick question, because it's interesting as the conversation developed. Chris, has there been any serious discussion, other than you following what's happening in other areas and practice, best mm -hmm. practice on, on managing your way out of this? Has there been any full discussions with the, the, either be it the economy or infrastructure and in specific guidelines how you're going to move forward? We, we, we all understand the social distancing. Mm. But has there been any other conversations or specific guidelines for you in managing your recovery as you go forward in terms of physical, some of the physical infrastructure? Yeah. Has there been direction about removing seats or, yeah. or any of that? Or like Dolores mentioned, masks, um, I don't know where it's the economy or, infrastructure, or collectively whoever's responsible. Yeah. Has there been any discussions about that? Well, there has been a number of fronts. The, 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 the uh, ones that are ahead of this a little bit from a UK perspective are the Department for Transport. And they have a safe. They have a set of safe travel guidelines for public transport operators, and we're very much using that as our guidance. But as I said, the Department of Infrastructure is also working on uh, uh, um, um, safe travel guidance as well, and we will work with them on that. And, and some of these areas will be addressed in that too. Uh, and, and given direction to you know we mentioned the enforcement because. I'm sure you're your driver out there, and you're saying even if it was a case of using masks. Yeah, but our, our unions will be consulted right. in that. You know, uh, I know the unions want to be consulted in any of that guidance, so so they will be consulted in that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm very mindful, obviously, that Translink is a business, and not to be cold about this either. Yeah. That um, I mean, there's a considerable amount of um, money and uh, effort has been put in in order to increase your passenger numbers over over a, a number of years with glider and so on the investment there has been um, quite considerable um, and really you know how you've marketed yourself during that period of time has been really very impressive and unfortunately then we get to the stage then where we you're not your messaging is essentially do not use our services mm -hmm. it's really about where we go to and how, how to get out of that in, yeah. in a very very sensible way and, and, and a balanced way but mindful even the comment that Dolores made around concessionary fares you have a cohort of people there now who will be genuinely afraid mm -hmm. to get onto your service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in the longer term, you know, how do you foresee that challenge being overcome? It is a difficult one, and I have to say it breaks my heart. Like in terms of uh, some of the messages we've had to put out, but you've got to put that in the context that people have lost their lives during this. So, I suppose that's that's I suppose where we've got to remind ourselves. Um, I would say going forward, um, the first. You know, we see it happening in a number of phases. You know, maybe aligned to the, the phases uh, um, of recovery as well. Um, certainly, the first phase we see is very much a message about, you know, um, keeping public transport safe, and that public transport is safe to use for 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 people who need to use it, uh, and that's our key message at the minute. Um, we know that some of the messages have been a little bit. Um, um, more creating fear, and, uh, and, and we don't think that's necessarily the right approach. We think we can maintain 
public transport and keep it safe for people in this area, in this first stages of recovery, and that's our plan is to do that. As we move beyond that, um, we see the message very clearly about there are other safety and risk issues that people need to consider. They need to consider the environmental issues. I've mentioned air quality is also uh, uh, you know, an, an invisible risk that people don't all, all, always aware of, and obviously the climate change risk as well. And, and to start balancing those risks, and maybe hopefully with more people using walking and cycling as well, we can, we can balance the use of public transport and uh, active travel. Um, and then, I suppose, at a, at a later stage, Whenever people feel that COVID-19 is, is behind us, or at least is managed in a, in a, in a way that uh, people feel more comfortable with it, we can start marketing our services again as, uh, as a way for people to, uh, to look to travel. Um, and, and I think you know, travel patterns and behaviours will possibly change, um, and there possibly is an opportunity to, to maybe talk to people about saying, well, you know, if you maybe are going to be working, two or three days at home and two or three days at work, well then, rather than having a second car for that two or three days, it might be easier to use public transport at those times and then you know, work from home with other days. So there will be a behavioural change that maybe will suit uh, uh, the message uh, for public transport as well. So Although, I'm still an optimist. Although that, that. Behavioural, <laughs> sure. although that behavioural change may be to the detriment of public transport yeah, and, and why we're all very encouraged by the number of people here now taking up cycling and walking. Obviously, the weather has helped that. Yes. So we may have fair weather of cyclists and fair weather yeah. um, walkers, which may uh, align with the fact that the message has been very clear about not using public yeah. transport, that that may then push people back into their vehicles. So. Yeah, but I, and, I, and I suppose it is that you know, if patterns change, so maybe our regular travellers are travelling less because they're maybe working from home, but if more people do that, you will still, you know, we'll, we'll still balance that out and get an increase in public transport. Of course, is what, we, is what I of, hope to see. Yeah. But the impact of people working from home obviously has a detrimental effect on other businesses then as well, because obviously yes. lunch times and so on. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. Job buying and absolutely. You know, so I suppose it's, it's very much a, a broader package that we need yeah. to look at. But look, no one else has indicated, and I thank you very much for okay, your time you. this morning. And um, no doubt we will be chatting to you again in the not too distant future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we've got a, f a few minutes um, before we um, just finish. Just in relation to um, matters coming out of that discussion, there's further exploration with regards to furlough. We did write to um, the three ministers. Uh, we, yeah, we wrote, we wrote to a variety of ministers last week on lots of things, but <laughs> number particularly around furlough. Um, we'd, spoke, we'd written to the minister in relation to Infrastructure Minister and to Finance Minister with regards to furlough. So um, we expect a response next week with regards to that. Okay, will we have a f We'll have it for next week. Okay, okay there's well, a reply on finance. So um, maybe what we want to do, maybe if you're content to wait for the response coming from Infrastructure Minister with regard to that, then we can follow up again. Um, we do need um, further information with regards to and more clarity around public transport. It began. We wrote to Finance Minister last week around the 59 million, but I suppose this is a broader issue around um, the up to now 130 million, um, which is obviously a substantial increase even from the estimate that, that we had. So if we could, if members are content that we write. Um, to both the finance minister and to the infrastructure minister in relation to that. Okay. Uh, Anything else? Can also get a copy of the guidance ourselves. Uh, yeah, if we can ask. Well, we could. Do, yeah, we could ask for a copy. Of Maybe in the public. I don't know. Yeah. Just how to access. Yeah. Although I suppose that we we have. I suppose the we have concerns now, given the fact that it was TransLink themselves whom we have to make the approach to. Um, the department on furlough um, rather than the other way around, despite the conversations that we'd had in the chamber and in this committee. Okay, so moving then on to um, correspondence. Um, correspondence memos at page 22. Um, some of the highlights in relation to the correspondence would be page 24. There's a, uh, a response from the department in relation to um, issues which were raised at our WebEx meeting with CBI. So, um, Chair, could could we could we ask the department where the where the planning act is at? Could we yeah, ask there, just yeah. as a follow up the review of the planning act? Can we ask? Yeah, that, there is. It says the, at the end of that, it says the yeah. minister intends to consider the way forward in this in coming weeks. Um, 
So okay. we could we'll keep, keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on that. We'll come back on that because Sorry, we Chair. really know where they review you, but it's not. So Ms. just Kelly? on the on the planning as well, I, I noticed by councils, you know, on the number of weeks, it would be interesting to know on a breakdown by each council, you know, just in terms of the response. I do know that there are difficulties in my local planning service. You know, uh, I think some of it's about IT and infrastructure as much as anything else in terms of being able to allow people to... Mm. Uh, safe distance and work from home, you know, and GDP, all the different regulations would be interesting. Uh, I'm just, just curious, specifically you Specifically know, in relation to COVID, how they're responding, or is this a broader issue just in well, relation to... I think it's the, the broader issue in relation to councils, you know, and how uh, they are um, um, processing the applications, and then in light of COVID, you know, what difference has that made to the uh, work stream? Mm -hmm. okay. But there's a specific question about the IT system, isn't it? Yeah, I think well, part of it was... You, you, we, we went through this process updating the IT system a number of years ago, getting ready for the transfer mm -hmm. over to councils. But I think there's another... Now, that's a council issue, but we could ask for a wee update on where... Yeah. The on the, IT, it's the actual IT system. Yeah. So, as well yep. as... Yeah, yeah, it is. I think so it's, isn't it maybe a year or two years away, I think, okay. from... Well, but we can ask it. We can get an update in relation to that. Okay. Um, any other issues with regards to correspondence? Members content with the memo? Is Ms. Anderson? Um, we're moving on to another correspondence around the taxi industry on page 32. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, if we could, uh, could we try to get an update from the department um, in relation to the Department of Economy and, and the Department of Infrastructure on we, this? I know yeah. there's correspondence there. We wrote, there, to, them. We wrote but, um, to them all. We to them all last week with regards to that, so we're still waiting. Okay, response. so we're still waiting a response on that. No problem. Um, I have another one on page um, 124 uh, in relation to haulage support. And if we could ask the department, we've already sent a letter yep. in on that. So it's just to try to chase that up if we could yeah. hear back from the department Again, to identify what evidence is there um, in relation to strengthening the case. Yep. Again, that's that was all sent last was week. Was that last week too? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. We 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 sent a lot of letters last, last week. Last week. Okay. I'm going to add another one then at that under AOB if I can. And we also sent. There was also the letter sent in relation to the um, cons consultation around um, the city centres and so on. Too. Yeah. That yeah. was also sent. Okay. Moving then to page 127. Um, we have the SR 2020-88, the Motor Vehicles Wearing of Seatbelts Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 29th of April and the committee was content. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are, the mem are members content with this rule? Content. Content. Thank you. <laughs> that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 the Motor Vehicles Wearing of Seatbelts Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Uh, moving then to our forward work programme, um, you'll find that at page 136. Cathy, would you like to? Um, we just have um, two briefings scheduled. We have the Mundaring Round for next week and the following week we have the Mineral Products Northern Ireland. We have nothing yet scheduled for the 24th of June or the 1st of July. They're the two weeks before summer recess. So if anybody has okay, there, there were some other issues just like they were outstanding from our list from before, mm -hmm. um, particularly around flooding and rivers and also yeah. roads. Yeah. So uh, it might be if um, it's possible to get... <coughs> Officials for for those issues because certainly yeah. they were mm -hmm. they were outstanding um, and it, it might be useful if we do get a little bit extra time even at the end of next week's meeting even just to have a, a, a brief discussion about what we do then towards for the end towards yeah. the end of the. Um, Chair, I always session. think it's a good to keep road safety in mind as well. You know, if we could uh, get an update maybe on the figures whether or not. With the fall off in traffic, you know, there's. You okay, would, well, do you want, would you want to raise that? We'll, we can raise that then as part of our, our of any other business that we would then raise yeah. that and make correspondence then with the minister with regards to that to see whether there has been any sort of change in um, figures. Mm -hmm. okay. um, members content with the forward work program? Great. 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 Great
Ms Anderson, Mr Beggs and then Mr Boylan. Um, I'm dealing with a number of uh, driving instructors who um, are keen to know the stage that they're at in the five-step plan. So what they're asking, they're not in fairness to them saying we want to date, they just want to know where they fit into the stage. So it might be worth writing to the minister just to, for the, her to indicate where they actually fit into the stage. Is it stage five? Obviously there's an issue around social distance, and, but they just they don't know. No, there was actually an issue was raised actually by um, Tom Buchanan um, a number of weeks ago during one of the COVID sessions where he had said, obviously with um, motorcycle tests could continue and we, we didn't actually get a response. He didn't get a response with that. The minister was going to explore. So we, we may not want to yep, explore yep. that further because that's something which could be done with social distancing. Yep, yep. Um, I know that it is isn't also an issue, obviously, for LGV and so on too. Um, and obviously this will have an impact then on, on further on, on holidays in the sector. Um, and there ha was already a backlog. But many a backlog. So basically. how will that then be addressed moving yep. forward? Yep. Okay, Mr. Beggs. I was actually just on, on that issue myself. Um, many businesses are having to prepare to come back to work and put in all uh, necessary protections for their staff and, and detailed plan how they can uh, provide a service to their customers. And uh, there would be um, two to three hundred, two to two hundred, say two fifty, large good vehicle license tests each month normally. None is happening, and eventually this will start to impact on the economy. So we do need to know. And aside from that, there are about twelve to fourteen thousand ordinary driving tests um, each quarter. Again, that's affecting people getting to their work. So what I think we need to be um, seeking information from the department is what detailed planning are they taking place to provide protection to their instructors, so that we can provide the service that is needed in the community. Mm -hmm. one, that's one of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Mr Boylan? Yeah, Chair, just a wee, um, maybe we write to the department, just some of that conversation around uh, discussions with the union and how they want to manage. All that can we write, what specific guidelines has been sent, and how we manage this, because, I mean, I've been on some of the bus drivers and they're, they're getting different things, but... You know, if they get on with mass or where they stand, or who, that's not their responsibility. So maybe we update from what discussion is taking place with the unions. Okay, right. Clear, clear guidance. Yeah, clear yeah, guidance. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Okay, because that would obviously would transcend TransLink. It would obviously go right across to the public service. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because, I mean, it's not their responsibility to say you could I understand there or do this. Okay. So, I mean, and I was just we update what this. Okay, thank you. Any other issues? Just one thing. Mr. Muir. Just aware, obviously, around the act of travel, there's been quite a lot done around that. Yeah. Um, there's a walking and cycling champion appointed. There's work being done by SOS Trans, and maybe that's something to be considered as part of the further work programme because there's quite a lot going yeah, on. There. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay, members content? Any other issues? No? Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, whenever you're leaving, just remember to lift up your own papers and your, your water and, um, and cup. And the next meeting will take place on the 10th of June in this room at 10 a.m. Thank you. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Senate Chamber Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is